Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Thank you for joining us again this week on the program. Uh, we're going to do something just a little bit different than we have for the last several weeks. We've been in the middle of a series uh, on the book of Revelation. But being it is the Christmas season, I wanted to share a few things during this Christmas season and probably again next week for New Year's that I believe will bless you. Uh, let me first say to you from the bottom of our hearts, from Lynn House Ministries and the whole ministry team here at Lynn House Ministries and the television program that you might have life, a very Merry Christmas to you and a Happy New Year. It is the season uh, to be joyful and to rejoice because Jesus is the reason for the season. Uh, I want to jump in and just share a little bit from the Christmas story that I believe has such powerful uh, to me, prophetic overtones of things that can be relevant to us even in the season that we are in. And uh, so I want to share that with you probably this week, and then we'll touch a few things uh, again next week uh, concerning the kingdom and the increase of His kingdom and His whole purpose for coming. And while they may seem to step out of uh, what we've been sharing from the book of Revelation, yet they will be relevant because we are talking about in the series on Revelation, we've been talking about uh, the passing away of an old covenant and the birthing of a new covenant and the passing away of an old covenant uh, system of government to a kingdom form of government. But uh, I want to read to you from Luke chapter 2, and I know you've probably already been in the festive mood of this whole Christmas season. But to me, uh, the Christmas story has really a striking impact on my heart uh, because it was one of the traditions in my household the whole time I was growing up. My dad would always on Christmas morning as the whole family would begin to gather around the Christmas tree and our whole family would begin to gather at my mom and dad's house. One of the traditions was that my dad would take the Bible and he would sit down and he would read the Christmas story. Uh, we would always chuckle as he would read it because he would sometimes mispronounce many of the words. He did it almost every year and uh, I, I probably uh, shouldn't even mention it but to me it's a great memory. But my dad would read this Christmas story. He would talk about uh, that uh, in, uh, that Caesar, uh, there, there went out a degree. He would always say instead of decree, he would say there went out a degree from Caesar in August. And so we always teased each other as he would get ready to read that song. We wondered if Caesar was going to get his decree, his degree, I'm sorry, his degree again this year in August. But uh, he would always misread that. We'd have a chuckle about it. Nevertheless, it's, I've got fond memories about those things. It is those little things. He did that every year uh, as long as I can remember and he read the Christmas story and to me it is a great impartation. Uh, you know uh, without being legalistic let me just say to you that's one of the things that ought to be done. I think that there are traditions that we have during this time of the year where we celebrate that uh, you know instill things in our children concerning what this season is truly about. And, uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't want it to get lost in all the trappings of it because the real story is what Jesus came to do for us. And so maybe you can make that a tradition in your household. We uh, pray then and then we would begin to open gifts and it would be always a great time. Sometimes we would share uh, what, how, what we were thankful for that year. And uh, I can remember some of the great times we'd sit around with the family and we'd just sometimes get to weeping and crying and thanking the Lord for things that happened. And it was just a real good time of bonding. And still these many years later, our family is still very close as, the, as you know, a result of that. That to me is the valuable stuff in life. That's the stuff that we pass on that means something to not only us, but to our children and to our children's children. I, I just get excited this time of the year, especially with my grandbabies getting old enough to really enjoy, uh, you know, this Christmas season. My oldest granddaughter, Ellen Grace, said to me the other day, I said, Ellen, uh, I want you to give Pappy a kiss and a hug. And she said, Pap, uh, the reason I have not been giving you kisses and hugs lately is because I'm saving them for Christmas. And I had to laugh. I thought, now that's really a funny little story there, but I sure hope I get some kisses and hugs from Ellen Grace and from Aspen Tabor, my other granddaughter, on this Christmas coming because that to me is the valuable stuff. So I hope she's saving those hugs and kisses up for Pappy uh, real good. But anyway, I, those traditions and those things to me as we have the opportunity to pass on our heritage from generation to generation, 
I believe it is the responsibility of parents to do those things. You know, just the simple things of praying around a table with them, uh, imparting to them the value of being in the house of God, uh, teaching them even to give. You know, I give and and even though I preach grace, I'm, I still believe in uh, covenant giving. I'm a tither in my local church, and I, I believe that, uh, you know, that you know, being taught that at a young age is what, uh, you know, really set me on a path for success, even financially. And so, um, you know, I believe those are things that as we impart things to our children, we've got the greatest influence. While we, you know, may talk about, well, we took prayer out of the school, the problem is we took it out of our homes. And I really don't necessarily think that we need to rely on the schools to teach our kids to pray because then we get in a fight over which prayer they ought to pray. So the responsibility still lies upon us as parents and as grandparents to impart to our children the things that are valuable and important to us. And so uh, these traditions to me are something that are awesome. But I want to get in this because I'll, I'll be out of time talking about and get real nostalgic about it uh, here before I even get into the Word. But Luke chapter 2 was the, uh, was the chapter that my dad would always read. And it starts like this. It says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a, a decree. See, so almost messed up and did what he did. There went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of, Cyr of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Now, several things that catch my attention when I read this and the thoughts that hit me is that, uh, first of all, it was a time of great taxing. Uh, you know, I don't think it would take a rocket scientist to uh, kind of step out of this paradigm and say uh, to you that we are even in this season living in a great time of taxing. And when, while we, we can, uh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, kind of uh, equate this to that season and they were physically being taxed monetarily, uh, you know, uh, we really in this hour uh, with all of the stuff that's going on in our world, with, uh, uh, you know, the stuff that's going on in the Middle East, with our economy, with our, uh, our whole system, uh, that it's a time of great taxing, taxing time, if I could say it like this. But we could get bogged down and become very negative about the taxing time, or we could turn our focus and see that during a great time of taxing, or if I could say it like this, pressure or opposition or not the most conducive of circumstances, that that would be the time when God would choose to give birth to a son. Uh, I feel like we are living in a season while we could take our focus uh, and really put it on the taxing time, and uh, we could, you know, we could we could preach things that would focus in and discourage people, and talk about how bad it is, and and uh, you know, we could talk about uh, world situations, and 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 uh, and let me say to you, I'm very well aware that they are very real in our world. But what happens to me is I turn my focus from the taxing to what God chose to do in that season. What God chose to do in that season was to give birth to a son. Probably in my next se uh, segment, I'm going to talk about this a little bit, but Isaiah said, unto us a child is given. Unto us, us, or unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. It was at the time of great taxing that God get, chose to give birth to something. One of the things that even Matthew 24 speaks of, and it was talking about the transition of that season uh, that they were in during this time in history, when he talked about in Matthew 24, and we've, we've talked about this over uh, probably the last 12 programs in our series that we've taught on Revelation, especially when we dealt with the Olivet Discourse. You will hear of wars, rumors of wars, they'll deliver you up to be killed. Uh, and, and in King James it says all these things 
uh, are the beginning of sorrows. Uh, other translations say all these things are the beginning of birth pains. So it was during the season of great transition and pressure that God was saying, not only is this a time just of sorrow that produces nothing, but this was a time of great transition of God giving birth to something brand new. And what was being birthed was a new covenant. Uh, what was being birthed was the kingdom of God was really coming on the world scene on a massive level. And we'll talk about that just a little bit as we get into this a little bit deeper, probably even next week. But during this taxing time, one of the things that it did was it, 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 it drove every man into the house of Bethlehem. They went to Bethlehem uh, uh, in Judea, which is called Bethlehem to the city of David, because they were the house of lineage of David. So one of the things that I believe happens during the time of taxing in our lives is, number one, it brings us back to to Bethlehem, which is the house of bread. It bring, you know, one of the, the things that I've noticed that happens a lot of times when people get under pressure, when they're going through things in their lives, sometimes they seem to avoid the house of God. To me, that's when you really need to get in the house of God. Maybe the season you're in during this Christmas time, it hadn't been the best season for you and your family. Maybe there are things out of uh, order in your life and things are falling apart. Marriage is broken. Uh, kids separate. Just, you know, sometimes this is really a time of great heightened awareness of things where people can either be greatly joyous or greatly depressed, depending on what's happening in their lives. But even whatever's happening in your lives, you can seize the opportunity to say, you know what? I'm going to make some changes because what I'm going to do instead of continuing to do the same things, hoping I'll get a different result, is I'm going to find my way into the house of bread, into the, if I could say it like this, into the house of God where the true bread of life is being served and make some, not, not me, but allow God to make some changes in my life that will give birth to a whole new dynamic in my life for the coming year and it will bring me into the city of David because they were the house and lineage of David. Another thing that happens during the time of great taxing is that it brings us into an awareness of our lineage. What is our true roots? In other words, when we come into times of taxing, times of pressure, seasons in our lives that of opposition, uh, what's going to happen is that what is in our true nature and our DNA and our lineage is going to begin to surface. The good news is if you're a believer, you've got a lineage that's out of the same lineage of the house of David. There's royal blood flowing in your veins. And what happens is, is that this great awareness of who you truly are, I believe one of the things that this ministry especially has emphasized over the years is identity, who you are in Christ. Because in the time of crisis, who you are in Christ can begin to arise in the midst of this whole circumstance of taxing time. And as you find yourself into the house of bread, it is a time and a season when you should be, note this, it said concerning her, <coughs> that she should be, excuse me, delivered. And she brings forth her firstborn child, uh, first, this says, it, and it says that, uh, verse 6, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. So these times again are times of great deliverance. God is de bringing his people into a great time of deliverance. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the end, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in their field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, to me, as I read this part of the story, what happened during this taxing time is Mary brought forth her firstborn son, laid him in a manger. And you know what amazed me? I started catching this thought about this, and I started thinking, you know, she laid him in a manger. And then it immediately says, and there were at the same season shepherds. Now, when I think about shepherds, I, I know it's talking historically about shepherds with literal figure, you know, literal lambs running around all this, uh, all over the, you know, mountainsides. But as I think about this prophetically, I think about shepherds being pastors who are shepherding their flocks even in a night season. 
there are a lot of pastors who are shepherding their flocks in this night season, and they're keeping their uh, watch over their flocks by night. And the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore afraid. So they were in their night season, <coughs> excuse me, and fear was gripping their hearts because they were in a season of taxing, a season of fear. But what I want to draw a connection to is that when Mary brings forth her firstborn son, she lays him in a manger. And I said, Lord, why a manger? And the Lord said to me, because it's a feeding trough. And I, thought, I said, well, Lord, I, I get that. It's a feeding trough. But why did you lay Jesus in a feeding trough. He said, because these shepherds who are watching their flocks by night need to know what to feed their flocks on. And man, some powerful hit me as I begin to understand that what he's saying is to these shepherds who are in their night season, he said, what you need to feed your flock on is you need to, you need to feed them on a steady diet of Jesus because that's what we preach and that's what we feed the people of God on is we feed them on a steady diet of Jesus Christ and his finished work and his death, his burial, his resurrection and his present reigning kingdom. And so when you begin to feed your flocks and you tell them, take your focus off the taxing time. Let's feed on Jesus. Let's feed on his finished work. Let's see if Jesus did something in his death, his burial, and his resurrection that can deal with the taxing time that I'm in. And certainly if we will feed the people on a steady diet of lamb, if we will feed them on Jesus, if I could say it like that, if we feed them on the corn of heaven. It's interesting to me that when Jesus was about uh, to be crucified, he says this concerning, and he says, except a corn of wheat, fall into the earth and die, it abides alone. <coughs> I think there's something that we must feed our people on in these seasons that I believe is powerful enough to bring them up out of this taxing time. And it goes on to say, Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, that the message I'm bringing to you is not a message of fear. It's not a message of judgment. It's not a message of coming catastrophe. For behold, look at this, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. In other words, the message God said to these shepherds who were in their night season is, listen, I've got a message of good news for you. That's what I'm trying to bring even in this message of Christmas to you is we are in a season of taxing time. There's stuff going on in people's lives, but I'm telling you the answer is Jesus. The answer in your life, sir, the answer in your uh, marriage is Jesus. The answer in your children that are misbehaving, the answer is is Jesus. The answer to your financial crisis is Jesus. The answer to our government problems is Jesus. The answer to the problems of religion in the world is Jesus. And the gospel, <coughs> excuse me, is called the good news because it brings a tiding of great joy which shall be to all people because the angel's message and declaration was from heaven was, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Because he's not coming this time in a manger as a judge. He's coming as a Savior. Somebody said one time, uh, you know, and this kind of does fit a little bit with what we've been teaching on Revelation, but, you know, God is about to judge America. And the truth of it is, is that, or, or God is about to destroy America. And the truth of it is, God is not about to destroy America. Americans are destroying America. But God is standing back saying to these Americans who are uh, trying to destroy America, uh, I, I want to be your Savior. The moment you call on me, I will answer. When you, when you call it, see, and I believe that what happens is, is that it's not that God originates or that God sends the catastrophes that are coming. But one thing you will notice is that almost every time there is a catastrophe, people will turn to Jesus. And it, you know what so happens so many times, though, is that that repentance or that turning is very fleeting just for that moment. But I believe that as we continue to declare a message of good news, uh, Jesus still is the answer because he, he's not only a Savior, historically, 
He's presently saving us. This is individually, this is in, in our own lives, our marriages, in our country, in our nation, is that Jesus is still the Savior of the world. Hallelujah. I feel the anointing when I say that. And He's just not the Savior of the world. He's my personal Savior. He saved me, but He's still saving me. And I need to move on because I'm running out of time here. But it said, This shall be a sign of you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And watch this. And on earth, peace and goodwill to men. I think one of the things, the great mistakes that we've made in the church is we've made the gospel uh, about a ticket to heaven or a get out of hell free card. And yes, that's there. We're not denying that. But once you've got your ticket, man, what you need to realize is that the message of the gospel of peace is that God is saying peace, not just for when you get to heaven, but peace on earth and goodwill. That's God's heart. That's God's intention. That's God's general posture is goodwill towards men. I hear people sometimes criticizing ministries and saying, well, those are the feel-good preachers. And, uh, you know, they just go to the church and they make them feel good. Well, that's why it's called the gospel. It's because it is the good news. And you ought to feel better when you leave the house of God than you did when you, when you came there. But if you feel beat up and dejected, you probably didn't hear the gospel. And they probably are still shepherds preaching stuff in their night season that's fear and trembling. I'm telling you, it's time to bring them back to the feeding trough and feed them on a steady diet of Jesus. He goes on to send it came to pass as the angels were going away that all of a sudden it's not just these shepherds, but now heaven is declared. And it's not just one or two, but it's a whole host that are beginning to declare, uh, you know, peace on earth, goodwill, to men. And it came to pass as the angels were going away from uh, them into heaven that the shepherds said one to another, let's go now even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord to offer the sacrifice which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents of the child uh, Jesus to do uh, uh, for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, The Lord, now let thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, a glory to the people of Israel. See, he's not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him, and Simeon blessed them, and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul, that they, the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. And she was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting prayers day and night. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake to him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And I want to just stop there because this is so powerful to me. But when Jesus is born, there's a man by the name, an old shuffling prophet by the name of Simeon. He didn't receive a fax. He didn't get a letter or an email. He heard the Holy Ghost say, what you've been waiting on is about to come to the temple of God. I hear the Holy Ghost saying to somebody right now, what you're waiting on, what you've been waiting on is about to be birthed and manifest in your life. But he goes up to the temple and when God, the Lord promised him, you're not going to die till you see uh, this Christ. Let me just say this because uh, it amazes me that uh, Israel missed the coming of their Messiah the first time he came. 
because he didn't come like they thought he would come. Can I tell you to me, it is concerning to me that maybe we've missed the coming of the Lord uh, in this hour because we're looking for him to come in a certain way and God is not obligated to fit his coming into an understanding of our paradigms. He may show up in ways you don't know. But let me say what happens in the midst of this is the moment he comes on the scene and Simeon lifts him up and declares, this one shall be for the rise and the fall of many that are in Israel. The Bible says, and coming in that instant, Anna. It is amazing to me that Anna's name means grace. Because the moment Jesus comes in is the moment that grace comes in an instant. If you don't know Jesus today, I encourage you to invite Him into your heart in this Christmas season. You may have never seen this program before, and you tuned in this morning. This message is for you. If you bring Jesus into the equation, coming in that instant is grace. And when you preach Jesus and you feed Him on a steady diet of this lamb that's in the manger, this feed trough, grace always shows up in an instant. It comes in that very instant. Grace is the answer to taxing time and to all of our problems, and Jesus is the grace of God. For the grace of God hath appeared to us. Grace is not just a message, it's a person. I trust you've been blessed from all of my team. I say Merry Christmas to you and your family and a Happy New Year. Take a moment to call that number on the screen and write to us. If you can help us preach the gospel of the kingdom, become a partner with us today or send a one-time gift, call the number on the screen or go to our website and do that today. God bless you and Merry Christmas to you and yours is our wish for you. For anyone struggling to understand John's writings in Revelation, This book provides true, biblically-based answers. Through detailed insights into the letters John wrote to the seven churches of his day, you will learn how to avoid the mistakes of the early church to overcome today's trials and tribulations. This book will provoke you to thought and dialogue, bringing greater clarity and revelation of Jesus Christ. 